All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Ryan Leary here from Recruiting Daily. Welcome to today's webinar, 2019's Recruitment Operations Best Practices Field Guide. We are going to have a very good and informative session. We're going to hang tight for just a moment as we still have a lot of people coming into the call. So we're going to allow people to get connected in. Uh, but we are going to be talking with Michael Krause today. Uh, we'll bring him into the call in just a moment. And uh, if if this presentation is like any of his previous, I know you guys are going to love it. A lot of great information. Uh, so as we're waiting, let's go through some housekeeping items uh, for today. Uh, the plan for today is pretty simple. Uh, everybody on the call is in listen only mode. So we can hear, you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. So if you have a question, Please ask your questions. On the right-hand side, you'll have a panel. Click the questions box there, add your question in. We will pull those out as they come in. We'll interrupt Michael if it's if it's um, relevant at the time. If not, then we'll queue them up and we'll get them all out. But we will answer questions before the end of the call today for sure. If you are on social and if you want to share this, please do. Uh, the hashtag is rdaily. Uh, so just go ahead and share that out. And yes, we are recording. Uh, that is probably one of our most popular questions. We are recording the, the call today. You will get the slide deck, and I believe Michael has a couple of items afterwards that we'll share as well, a couple of uh, intake forms and forms to, to follow and checklist. Uh, so you will get those as well as a thank you for joining. Uh, so again, welcome everybody. And at uh, this time, I want to bring uh, introduce Michael into the call. Well, in fact, Michael, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, but Michael Krause, who is the... Uh, Senior Global Manager for Technical Recruiting at uh, Walmart, right? Actually, right. I'm at for Recruiter on Demand, but uh, oh, I okay, have a contract go. consulting with Walmart as uh, right now. But uh, thank, thank you, you for that intro. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Mike, we'll, we'll go ahead and take it away. We'll, we'll pass it off here. Okay, great. Well, I've been doing this for about 30 years and been learning all along and been developing better ways of doing things from trial and error, from best practices, from other leaders out there. And I was asked by Ryan to say, what what do you use for a operations guy? What would you use for any company you walk in tomorrow? So taking that information and trying to make it into a presentation is what we came up with today. So this is a recruiter operations guide. This guide is really meant to deal with companies that are anything from a small where you're the individual full desk, whether it be an agency or corporate recruiter, or medium-sized companies where you may have sourcer or sourcers and recruiters there, and even large companies. All of the stuff I'm showing you is scalable. Uh, you, can, you can modify and make it your own, but these are best practices from startup companies also to Fortune 500 companies uh, are using these methodologies. The one key I would tell you for success on all of these is going to be to communicate with everybody. The more you communicate, the better you perform. The better you perform, the smarter you look. The smarter you look, the more confident your team client will have in you. By communicating them, whether the news is good or bad, sharing that information, making sure that they are aware, people are much more responsive to news they can handle than surprises. So part of this is establishing communications and then the type of communications that we want to do. You know, in doing that, you will build up confidence with your managers, with your clients, and the more confidence they have, the more they'll trust you. And by trusting you, you become the expert in the room. That they can do their job, whether it be accounting or IT, programming, managers, product, data science, whatever it is, that's their expertise. By communicating to them what's going on, how things are going, establishing levels of communication and sequencing, you're gonna become the expert because you know what works. And these tools are given to you so that you can have the tools that you need to make those things work for you. And the one of the first things I would tell you to do whenever you're establishing communications is go into the room knowing what you need to know. You don't ever walk into a meeting with a manager or even a candidate or a client without having some type of information. And I, people that know me know I talk a lot about competitive intelligence. You have to have this information so that you go in there informed 
in establishing you know what you're doing, you know what the roles entail, you know who the competition is, you know who your client's competition is if you're an agency. And you'll probably hear me refer to agencies and corporate in here because they're fairly interchangeable. It's just a matter of who your audience is. Some of the ways to find competitive intelligence is real simple. You can go to Boolean and type in related colon or similar colon with the company name .com. And usually in a Google or Yahoo or some of these, the first eight or 10 are gonna probably be the closest match to your company based on your company's profile out there and that they're trying to index and match up there. If you don't, if you don't feel real comfortable with Boolean or you're not sure, or you're trying to find more intel, there's a couple other sites I recommend. Hoover's is obviously good for that, but there's also one called Aller.com. I use that personally. It's good information whenever I get a new job or a new client I work with. I go in there and say, well, your company is this. I understand your competition is this, this, and this, correct? And by having that, they know that you know what they're doing. And a lot of times, you're going to know more than they are as far as even know who the competition is. And by knowing who the competition is, you know what they call their people. You know what their responsibilities are for their type of people. You can get information on salaries so you can share that with them. Because the more information you give them, the better it is for them to, or for you to set expectations with them on what's going on. You can get information from candidates when you're interviewing them. Um, I personally have used agencies I've worked with when I've asked them, you know, how competitive we are we, where do we stack, how does our, our total package look like, our total rewards program look like. And a lot of them are going to work with you and tell you because they want to help you get people. They know your strengths and they know your weaknesses so they can be a very good asset for you. And if you don't have agencies you worked with and you're not sure about pay, two good places to go to is salary.com and payscale.com. These are going to be relative to information that's put in. They've gathered from government agencies. They get a lot of good information. I know mortgage friends of mine use both of these sites when they're trying to figure out what somebody might make or what kind of income they need to show with somebody. So it's a very good um, sites to gather your pay intelligence when you're talking to, the, to a client or a manager. But again, knowing what the competition is like, knowing what they call people, because if you're calling an account executive, a salesperson, somebody else, that same role may be a business development representative and actually a high role where your business development rep could be a low person on the totem pole, if you will. So that's, again, have the competitive intel. Uh, the biggest tool you have for success is going to be an intake sessions. You have to have these. You need to insist on these with your clients or your hiring managers, or you're going to be like a mechanic working on a car and not knowing what's wrong with it and having no tools to walk in there with and have to keep coming out and slowing down the process. At the end of this, I'm going to share with you my intake that I've used at many companies over the last 10 years. It's simple, it's, it's, you can modify and adjust it. But what basically do in that uh, intake session is you wanna ask objective and subjective questions. You know, what are they required to do? What would you like to have? What are the skills must have? What are the nice to haves? You wanna get the top three of both, what they have to have and what is nice to have. Because the must have is what's gonna say, this person's qualified, and the nice to haves are this is why I'm recommending them. So it helps you put together that type of conversation. You also want to talk to the managers and ask them, is an 80% match good enough for you? Because, you know, 100% match may be the person you have working for you. But out in the market, we may not be able to find that for you. So if I get somebody that is 80% of these requirements, will you still talk to them? Then you want to ask questions or relative that are going to, or relative to what a candidate's going to ask you is, what's the makeup of the team? What's the size of the team? You know, what what am I going to get to do, and how do I impact the company? Now, I will tell you for IT side of things for developers, this is very important. This is a good tool to draw them in. You tell them you get to do this. What you're going to do is going to impact the company. It's going to impact consumers. It's going to impact anybody in any way because as much as they may be introverts or focus on their programming, 
they want to make a difference and they want to know what they're doing has a greater good and a greater capability. You also find that's a theme a lot of times with your uh, younger generations such as millennials and in generation Ys, they want to have an impact. So as you know what the team impact is or their personal impact is for the company and clients and consumers, that's a great way to sell them. But you want the manager to help tell you that, to help you sell that. And then to help hone into what you're looking for, ask for the top performers in the company. Who in our company is the top at doing this job? Hopefully you don't get the feedback that nobody is and that's why you're brought in, but hopefully you'll have something like that. Um, if there's a resume of the t uh, their top person or their top preferred candidate they may have seen from before or what they've known or they did some searching on their own and they went to an Indeed site or some site and said, hey, this is the type of profile I wanna get a people. Again, that'll help you decide the information you're taking, make sure the direction you're going is in the right direction. And again, uh, the last one here is list of daily responsibilities. You wanna be able to tell the person, what does my day look like? Cause you can, all of you that are experienced in recruiting know somebody's gonna ask, what do I get to do in a day? What's my typical day look like? You know, am I gonna be in meetings all the time? Am I gonna be administratively heavy? What is it that I get to do? As long as people can set the anticipation and they know what they're going to be coming in, it gives them the confidence that they're going to be successful at it and they will interview better for you as well. The next step you want to do, once you've gathered the intake information, you want to set interview protocol with the manager. You want to understand from them number of phone interviews versus on site. You know, when they do come on site, will it be individual or panels? Because you want to set the expectation with candidates because you've got to keep them engaged. You want to give the candidate a good experience. But also by talking to the manager, you're letting them know we need to set a standard. And with your experience for hiring, whether you're new or seasoned, you know there's a point after three to four interviews that there's a, a higher percentage of drop off in the interview process. So you want to establish what it is, and then see if you can't coach, counsel them. If it's one and done, then you know maybe you need to have second eyes on here. If it's five or six until we decide, then we need to talk to them about that. Or we're gonna have a panel, and it's eight people on the panel, and we're gonna have two hours with no breaks. You, know, you have to be able to coach them on that, but you wanna know what it is so you can set the expectation with candidates. Next, you wanna develop SLAs. You want to be able to tell them that you're going to get them X number of people in a certain period of time, and depending on the complexity of the role, you know, whether it's a senior level role, which can take longer, or it is a specific responsibilities in IT or, or a specific accounting task or something to that effect. You want to be able to tell them what you're going to be, get before they see their new candidate, before they start seeing any candidates. But you also at that time want to ask them to commit to you that when you do submit candidates, that you have 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever works for you or the speed of hire you need to work at, that they will respond. Because that is critical for your success is being able to tell candidates that, hey, you know, I'm sending you the manager, you had your interview, I'm going to have a debrief or talk to them. I should know something two days after your interview as far as final decisions. I may know as soon as the next day. Uh, so developing that communication sequence and then you wanna make sure how the manager wants the candidates presented. And I've worked in organizations for 30 years now and every manager is different, but you eventually can get to a consensus. Some want a skills tech list where they say the job description is what I want and you literally take that job description, put it in your summary and answer every single line. Some want more of a summary. You know, what, what did they do? Or how did they impact? Where did they make a difference? Do you understand what they're looking for? And you're obviously looking for people that have performance awards or maybe even patents depending on the type of roles you're doing. So you want to understand from them, you know, how they want to get the material they're gonna receive because you're taking time to put this together. You wanna to make sure that all of it's gonna be read, all of it's gonna be reviewed for them to make a, uh, a competent decision on next steps for you. Um, 
manager's interview to you, like I said, with the SLA sending those, their responsibility is feedback. You know, you don't want them to be hiring managers, and this is a side note, but don't call your managers hiring managers. They are not hiring managers. They are the manager of whatever they do, whatever their department is. So when you talk to a candidate, you're going to be speaking to the director of accounting. You're going to be speaking to the, the supervisor of material handling. You give the title of the person's role. Because so a hiring manager is a label we put on that doesn't help them understand who they're going to be interviewing with. And also, as respect back to the hiring managers, you want to use their appropriate titles so that they feel respected. They feel, again, you're the recruiter. You're not just the recruiter, and they're not just the hiring manager. They are the position which they were hired for. Recruiting and interviewing and hiring is just a very small part of their job. So let's not label them as if that's their only job where they're here. Otherwise, they're going to be working in your department, and you're going to be working in theirs. Um, one of the side notes I have here, I don't know if you can see it real well because the color's a little bit light, but you want to coach, counsel, whatever you want to call it with your clients and managers that if you don't make a decision, you need, it's your responsibility to warn them that the candidates in these markets will not stay available for long. You, and one of the best things I have found with them is saying, if you interviewed for a job or when the last time you interviewed for a job, how long was too long for you knew about next steps? When did you figure they were no longer interested? And if you put it in that context, they'll give you timelines and they're much more likely to commit to you to a level response rate. But this is also to use this when they want you to keep a candidate warm. Are we going to hire this person or not? Is there other considerations? Is there other interviews? You don't just put somebody on a shelf and wait like a little elf on the shelf and you go pick it up when you're ready. If you're going to put them somewhat on the on a second category or B candidates versus A candidates? Do we have additional interviews? What would you like to see from them that would help make them an A candidate? Don't let the manager tell you or the client tell you that the candidate is second rate without telling you why. And you need, as a, a responsible recruiter uh, or agency recruiter, is to find out what would make them an A player. Maybe the information was presented. Maybe the questions weren't asked properly to be able to help that candidate show themselves as an A player. Um, one of the things I will tell you that will be, sorry, was gonna be critical to your success is debriefs. Insist on them when you make an appointment for a candidate to interview, go ahead and schedule time with that decision maker afterwards, whether it's 15 minutes for a call, or maybe 30 minutes with the people that I've interviewed to get a debrief on this. And it's not necessarily so that you can inform the candidate what they did right and wrong. It's so you can understand what, what was made, uh, what met the grade, what didn't meet the grade, but also it forces them to come up with the consensus right away. Well, it's still fresh. Do they like, do they do not like, you know, what would you like to see more? What would you like to see different? It will help you in your recruiting efforts. And when you're working with sourcers or if there's sources on the call, you need to ask the recruiters for this information. Or if you're in the, with the meetings, ask, well, what is it we need to be looking for? So debriefs are very, very important for you to be successful. Again, for you to be the smartest person in the room, communicate, communicate, communicate. You ask in the beginning. You ask intakes, you ask expectations, and then you ask for feedback. You make it part of the requirements. You make it part of it in there. And I know some of you are going, well, my managers won't do that. It doesn't necessarily need to be formal. It could be you walking over to their department. What did you think? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? What do you want to see more of, less of? Talk to me. It doesn't have to be formal. It helps if you schedule it so that the managers know they have to have some type of decision or direction on the candidates. And it could be something that you may even have to stretch out, not that you'd want to, to maybe a debrief after all candidates where you all agree to review every candidate and determine how they fit into the organization. The, um, the conversational summary I have on here and being consistent is making sure that the standards you put in place and the communication you put in place, you need to hold that standards whether it's a conversational communication, 
with the writing or if they want fact finding, be consistent because what you do for one, you do for all. That's in that's an indelible HR law is what you do for one, you do for all. The same thing goes for manager your managers. You do the same for everybody. They know what to expect. They know the cadence. They know when to uh, go next steps with you. Um, one of the things you can do to help the managers, as you can see on here, is also an interview scorecard. If they've never interviewed people before or they have a tendency to put too much information on file, um, I've attached on the end of this seminar a scorecard that you can have them try with, which asks different type of questions that are open-ended, and they can grade the responses from the candidate. And sometimes that can be the easiest when you have a lot of candidates and you're trying to determine who's best, or if you're going through the first phase of candidates and you want to determine who's going to go on to the second or third phase with it. So a scorecard is a good way to have something to where it's, you you have objectives on there, you allow for some subjective comments, but you have A, B, C, D, one, two, threes, whatever you want to have on there to be able to tally how the candidates rank. So it helps eliminate some bias when you're done and trying to look at the best candidates. You know, this person scored 32 out of 35, this person 31, this third person 34, you know, and everybody else was 28. Well, let's bring these three in. Regardless of who they are, based on their interview results, we know that these are the type of candidates we want in the organization. So, and this is kind of jumping back to my intakes and your debriefs, send recaps of your conversations. Documentation will save you. Your intake session recap is once you've met with the manager, when you're done, agree upon it, or you say you're done, you take that information, you send the form that's attached to you or something like it and say, this is what I understand the role to be. Please let me know if I'm right or I'm not right. I'm on track. I'm off track. You know, because on that form, you're going to set SLAs. So by them agreeing to that, they're committing to you that they're going to perform on their level if you perform at your level. So ask for commitment back or answers back to those recaps. Is this what you, do, I, do I understand the role to be this? And my understanding is if I get you candidates that you're going to respond to me in this time frame, by them doing that, you've got something in writing. So if they don't respond and they start wanting to come back to you later for candidate flow or response, you have something to say, I asked you to agree. You didn't respond to candidates. You know, there's a point where we're not going to submit you any more candidates until we know what you're looking for. It's not fair to candidates. It's not fair to us. And it's not fair to you for all of us to be wasting this time. But that is probably one of the best things that can help you recruiters and agencies is recap what the conversation was so you have something tangible where they agreed to it. Because if they agreed to it, you have something you can hold them to it. Now, you're not going to be able to call them on the carpet on it, but it makes conversations in the future much, much easier to have saying, you know, you said 24 hours, we're at 48 hours. Is 48 hours going to be the standard? If it is, okay, let me send you a recap that we understand this is where it's going to be. Um, the other thing you want to do once you get, you've done your, your set up your intakes, you set up a cadence for your debriefs, you know, the information on them, you've got them to uh, commit to what they're going to do back and forth. The next thing you'd want to do is set up meeting cadences. And some of these may or may not be possible depending on the size of your organization, the number of hiring managers you have. But again, these are all these guidelines we're talking about are ones that are standards that have worked that get response, allow you to handle a lot of hiring. Because I can tell you that I hire anywhere between 60 to 140 people a year, depending on the contracts. So having this structure in place and be able to scale it, be able to work with it, be able to set the expectations, allows me as an individual contributor to organization to be as efficient as possible. And when I'm part of a team, it allows me to be efficient with my managers and my group as possible. But you want to set up weekly touch points with the hiring managers or agencies with clients. This is good because if you don't get to do a debrief or the size of your organization doesn't really allow it or the process really isn't there, setting up a weekly touch base is how do you like what you've seen? How do you like the specific person? What are we doing different? Where, where else should we go um, you know, that you think would work? Uh, give me some direction. 
let me tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, like I said, cover the debriefs, any change requirements, plans, you know, and then as you're getting information, as you're interviewing, say, with the market intel I'm finding, or based on candidates, or based on agencies, or based on this information, I'm finding that the trend in this market is this, or is that, or this role may be better if we change the title from regional infrastructure engineer to critical infrastructure, man, you know, manager, something to the fact that it allows you to be coaching them on what's going to be successful and how to make sure they get the person they want that matches the job they want. And lastly, on this particular screen is keep good records. Minimize intakes in the future. If you do a good intake, next time you have another role like that, you don't have to spend that 30, 45 minutes doing it. You can send that recap saying, we're doing this role again. Is this requirements the same? Yes or no? Is there anything you'd like to change? Yes or no? If not, great, then let me get started on this right away. So keep your intakes. And I will tell you that organizations I've worked for in the past have actually taken these intakes, and depending on the ATS, are able to attach them to the requisition, which is a great thing to have in the future if you go back and look at it. If not, you need to maintain good records for that. One of the things you're gonna to talk to the manager about is a sourcing plan. You wanna show them, and this is a kind of a pro tip, if you will, you wanna show them the top three areas you're going to focus. And I'm about to show you a lot more, but you wanna give them the top three because managers invariably over the last 30 years is what else are you doing? What else are you doing? Where are you gonna go? Where else have you looked? What else are you trying? You're probably gonna be doing a lot of these and probably stepping up to these before they're asking, but you also don't wanna come in and say, I'm gonna do all this because then you give them something to hold you accountable that may not be realistic for the position you're trying to fill. So I'll show you next screen. These are kind of, this is my first checklist of what I have. What resources do I go to? How do I establish my competitive intelligence? How do I source to look for people? You know, LinkedIn, LinkedIn Recruiter, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, all of those are good tools to start with initially. Uh, those looking for higher level people in organizations, executive recruiting, director VPs and up, LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a very good tool because you're able to track people, follow what they do, track what the information they put out there, and be able to jump when the moment's right to give you an opening of a door to contact them and a reason to. Competition, you tell your manager, you're gonna to go to the competition. The third one here is one that's missed by so many recruiters. I can't, cannot tell you how many organizations I've gone into, and especially big organizations, where they have a quarter million candidates in their database and they're struggling to fill roles. And you say, have you searched your ATS? No, why? It's literally, it's a gold mine. You know they're interested in your company. You know they, you know, you know some of their qualification when you call them. You have a referential point that your company, you know, is looking at them again, which helps you get the candidate to respond that you're now reaching out to them after they had reached out to you. This is a very big tool that gets missed by a lot of recruiters. Next, you want to talk to them about social media. You Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Medium. Uh, I can tell you that Brian Fink is probably one of the best guys I know around that had, can show you how to do social media searching. In fact, I think he has a video of where he's actually eating dinner or meeting with friends, was doing something on Twitter and at dinner, the candidate responded and the next day he was talking to them. Very good uh, tool for that, um, you know, very good example of how to utilize social media tools. Um, then obviously forums, there's resume databases. If you wanna contact me afterwards, I have a list of about a hundred resume databases that are on the internet that you can tap into, directories, profile sites. If you're looking for attorneys, a lot of organizations have that information out there for you. If IT, GitHub, Stack Overflow, CoderWall, uh, meetups is a great place to look for people, especially in markets that you're not in and you need intel on the ground and you need people in that market, try to join meetups. Um, sometimes they'll let you in, sometimes you can get in, find all the people before they kick you out when they realize you're a recruiter, but meetups is a great place to x-ray 
or at least try to join on the local markets. I also encourage managers, if they're actively involved, and these are gold mine managers, if you will, that get them to go to the meetups in those markets. Because you and I know that as a recruiter, we're screaming that we're hiring. But when a manager walks out there for his department says, I'm hiring, people are gonna flock to him because they wanna impress because they know that person can make the decision. Uh, same thing as earlier with getting competitive intel, you can x-ray trade shows, uh, they, you can use site colon company name, obviously a capital S not correct for those advanced Boolean people, but you can x-ray companies, you can x-ray trade shows that way. Uh, there's probably one called uh, Lanyard, which was a good one I've used in the past when I had to hire uh, specific engineers for markets. And then Ronnie Bratcher does a great seminar and he's part of HRTX, which is also part of one of the things I'm gonna recommend at the end, but he does a great alternate search engine. You know, Google's nice, but I can tell you that every search engine will lead to different results. Some of them have different languages, but changing your search engine can be huge. I can tell you that I've used Exalead for IT, which most people haven't heard of, but it is literally a mass of IT resumes. It's a French-based um, search engine, but it was all written in English. It's a very good tool, just as an example. But uh, check out, reach out to Ronnie Bradshaw regarding alternate search engines. He's got presentations, he's got seminars. Same with Brian Fink on that aspect. And let's not forget why we do this. You know, with a candidate experience, interview candidates with a conversation style, you wanna know why they're looking. That's the biggest motivator. I'm looking for upward mobility. Well, my position has this, a director and the president. Not gonna be a good match. Or I'm looking for stability. Or I'm looking for more money. Because whatever they have, obviously you're going to sell that your company offers that better than anyone else. You wanna also get them to tell them what they do in their current role. Is their title like yours, but their job completely different or they have much less responsibility or much greater responsibilities. Ask them what they're good at. If your job, what would you say that is your top two qualities or three qualities in your job you do better than anybody else? If you were to get a raise tomorrow, what would they base it on? Base it on. Now, if you were to be called into your office going, you know, Michael, you're not real good on details. You want to ask the candidate, where do they feel they need to improve or where do they want to learn more on, to, to better themselves? Where do they see that they're lacking in their skill set? Recruiters may want to be more sourcers. Sourcers may want to understand recruiters' interactions, um, understanding the jobs. You know, what does the job entail? You know, all of us have an area for improvement. So you want to ask that from a person because if they feel like they're going to come in and learn, that helps sell them on the opportunity with you. And then obviously you're going to ask them intake related questions and then the salary expectations. As we know, in 28 states, you cannot ask what they make, but you can ask them what their salary expectations are. And then you can ask, secondly, what do you base that on? And most times they're going to tell you either that's what I want or I want to raise over where I'm at, or I'm making X. But if you ask the salary expectations and ask what it's based on, that will certainly help you determine if they fit within your bandwidth. Now, a lot of them are gonna push back and say, what do you pay? Well, we pay depending on experience. That's why I'm asking what your expectations are to see if we can meet you at the point which, makes, which will allow you to make a decision to join us. With your candidates, you also wanna have a communication strategy, whether it can be weekly, email or call, you wanna set expectations with them that you've taken from the managers. You wanna let them know what the average time to make a decision is. And you also wanna create that you're going to let them know if there is no decision. I'm gonna let you know the good or the bad. Yeah, I'm gonna let you know whether we've made a decision, we're not making a decision. Just like anybody else, the communication, if they know what to expect, they may not like the message, at least they'll know. And they will always follow up and communicate more with you if they know and they feel like you're being forthright with them. You want to be able to create meaningful messages to them. 
you're always excited to talk to them. We at Walmart have a form that goes out to candidates that says, we're excited to talk to you. The team is looking forward to talking to you about this opportunity here. Here's the information we need for the call. Or I can't wait to meet you. I guess I got the WA missed on this presentation, but can't wait to meet you on site. Our team is excited to meet you. So-and-so is going to meet you at the door, or you can ask for so-and-so when you get there. We're excited to meet you and see if there's a match between us. Just you want to create some type of excitement, some type of conversation that is there's an anticip anticipation of them coming in the door. And if your organization can do this, and I've done this at a lot of companies, especially when I was on site, is have signage on the front that says, welcome, Michael Kraus. To see my name in there, to know that they are doing that for me as a visitor to their organization makes me feel important walking in the door. So what would make you feel important? And those are the type of communication strategies you want to have with them. Make sure the message helps set the next set of expectations as far as when the meetings will be, the steps will be, your communication will be, when you'll be able to get in touch with them, what style that you're going to communicate in. You know, it may be that you're going to text them after a meeting or text me as soon as you get out, depending on the intimacy you have with the candidate and the relationship you have with the person making the hiring decision. Lastly, make rejection as positive as possible. We had several candidates that was it was a tough choice. You know, your skills were close, but we found something that close, more closely matched our uh, roles, but keep, please keep looking at our sites and contact us if there's future opportunities. I can tell you last year, I made four hires from rejections because the communication from the rejection was positive enough to where they found me somebody they thought was better or somebody they worked for and sent them to me. So I, last year, I made four hires with a client from rejected candidates referring people to me. Keep them positive, keep them to where you you were so close, but you weren't there is some of the best messaging. And I will tell you, of my 30 years of doing things, that has served me well. I've also had candidates I've turned down that I ended up going working for 10 years later. And uh, that was always a surprise. And the fact they brought that up to me, that that was one of the best responses they had to not getting a job. And that's why they considered me for the opportunity when I went into another role. Um, when making an offer to candidates, again, you need to make it compelling. You want to sell the features, appeal to the reasons they applied. Again, the intake you've done with the manager, you know what they're looking for. You've talked to the candidate. You know what their motivations are. What are they looking for? When you make the offer, say, we have an offer that's going to allow you to do what you want it to do, allows you to do A, B, and C. You want to sell them on the excitement of the opportunity what they're going to get to do before you just say, hey, we want to offer you the job for this and this money. Um, next communication strategy of people that you don't pick, but if you're required to pipeline candidates, which a lot of us are required to do, depending on the organization, the time of the year, the hiring seasons, if you have them or not, you want to set up communication tools. Newsletters are good for that, self-created or company newsletters, industry-specific news, and if possible, automation. I use an ATS when I work with clients called Luxo, and I can automate messaging to candidates. I can automate messaging to managers or clients, potential clients. I can set the sequence. I can set the messaging. So my pipeline candidates, I can say day 21, day 45, day 60, send this type of messaging out when it's newsletters. I can also set information regarding our company to go out in relevant that relates back to our website that's public information. But again, you're communicating, you're showing interest in that candidate. It can make all the difference in the world. I can tell you I've done a very large farmer project several years ago where we had 3,000 people in a pipeline and we sent newsletters monthly. And it was just about industry trends. And part of that was, you know, we're getting close. We have this opportunity coming up. We will be reaching out to you. Long story short was, by the time we were done, we went from 3,000 to 800 to 300 to hiring 100. And the communication strategy was with them, they felt like they were interested in us, and they, they stayed interested in us, rather, and that we showed we had interest in them, 
even if they didn't read the newsletter, they were getting something from our company. It showed that we wanted them at some point in the future, we wanted to be able to present opportunities to them and hopefully hire them. And meet with managers after hire. You, got, you have to get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Changes may need to be made on both sides. It is critical, again, with communication. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And again, by having these standards and these documentations and these communication standards going along, hopefully this will be a very small uh, experience. But you want to be able to share with the managers after, after a hire or after an interview, be able to share that with a candidate to give them some direction. You don't want to give them direct feedback because we all know that can bite you. But you may be, hey, your resume needs to be written better. Or this was what we were really looking for somebody you know, that you knew they were short and to try to give it. Not that we didn't select you because of this, but we chose a selection for a higher, uh, higher level role. Um, for recruiting operation success, I wanted to make sure I share this with everybody. You need to surround yourself with experts in the industry, strong peers, get out there and network, whether it be Facebook groups, if it's, you know, where your social networks, you can get out there and join that are industry specific. There's ones for just about everything you can think of, of all different sizes with all level of communication. Those groups I have found like with Facebook are some of the most sharing and caring of information. I have the situation, how would you do this? I'm not finding people. And response is, well, have you looked here? Have you tried this Boolean string? Have you done this information here? Next, HRTX, which works with Recruiting Daily, has events. Those are great places to go to. Uh, here in Atlanta, I think we had 120, 130 people. But everybody was there to learn. Everybody was there to share. Everybody wanted to know more information. There was great ideas shared. There was vendors in the room uh, that could share information that were attending, actually, so they could learn more about this. It is a great place to get information on latest trends. Uh, like I said, Ronnie Bratcher speaks at it, Brian Fink does. You can find out some of their tips and tricks on how they do that. They do travel around the country. Also, there's the Sourcing Institute, which Shally, I think, is part of uh, the instructors on the groups um, in most of the cities here. Tons of experience in sourcing, especially in specific social medias. So that is HRTX. I would highly recommend if it comes to your market is a good place to go. And finally, I've got the last one here is resources. Um, books I recommend that you have or read. Um, I can tell you I've been doing this 30 years and these three books I learned something from. I've read a lot of books, but these three actually have great feedback for us. And then other resources obviously is YouTube. Um, there's training form and tools tools are on here. And then I think I haven't put the Sourcing Institute. So with that, Ryan, that's the pr presentation. And last word is invest in yourself. Buy the books, go to the training. The more you know, the more you grow. Yeah. Hey, Michael, thank you so much. And for everyone that's on the call, you're going to get a copy of this presentation. So you don't need to jot those links down. We'll make sure we put those in the uh, follow-up email as well. We do have some questions that have come in, so let's go ahead and get um, okay. and get those answered. And so I see, Michael, you're pulling up the uh, the intake form, and that is part of the question. So for everyone that's on the call, uh, there were a few questions that were around uh, the intake forms and some of the forms that Michael was talking about. He does have those and we have those. And so you will get those sent to you in an email as well. This is an example of one of those. Um, but Michael, before we jump in the questions, uh, two things I wanted to bring up, you mentioned HRTX. And so why we still have a lot of people here in a call, we do have an event, a training event coming up uh, in New York and LA. So if you're in New York and if you're in LA, we have two amazing panels coming up. Uh, the first is in New York. That is in November, November 5th, I believe it is. That's awful, I should know that date. Uh, but that is going to be held uh, right there in the city, uh, right near Bryan Park. So it's gonna be a 
really, really good event. We'll send those links out. And then we have LA coming up as well. Um, so that's going to be another great event. So keep keep an eye on your email. We will get those links out to you if you're in those areas or you can get to them. Highly, highly recommend it. And we also have 12 uh, intensives uh, training events next year already on the schedule. Uh, so hopefully we can see at one of those. Uh, so here, here's some questions. Can you share examples of objective and subjective questions? This was way back in the beginning. You had, a, I think, it up on the right, screen there. Right. Well, objectives are what are they going to be doing? What specifically requirements are they going to have? Uh, you want to ask questions that are going to be what is it they need to do to be successful? And that manager is going to tell you they need to make X number of calls. They need to be able to do this type of program. They need to be able to make this level of impact within their res responsibilities. Um, subjective would be as, you know, it doesn't matter what school they come from. Are you looking for somebody that is more tenured or less tenured? Um, as you can see in here is you're asking what are the three must-have skills qualification to be considered for the roles? That's very objective. And very subjective would be, you know, what are some questions and responsibilities you want me to ask that are kind of open-ended, that are more of what you'd like to see? What what do you want them to explain on how they did, how do they do this programming, how did they recruit, how did they uh, handle tax preparation, any type of open-ended questions that are asking them to explain themselves or more of your um, subjective, because the answers can be right, there's no right or wrong to the subjective answers. Question. Got it. Okay, can you talk, can you talk a little bit about what you should include in an SLA? And I, I guess probably yeah. have to go generic here because obviously those right. are going to be client dependent, project dependent. Right. Yeah. Your SLAs are going to be number one, communication. What level are we going to communicate? When am I going to, second, when am I going to submit resumes to you? What's the time frame? When are you going to get back to me? Um, service level agreements that I use is typically seven to 10 days on the first set of candidates when I have the luxury of being a corporate recruiter. Agency recruiters usually don't have that much luxury luxury but you want to be able to put something in place for that because also the slas is our goal is to have this role filled by 30 days 45 days or our goal is to have offers by x date uh, depending on what you have i can tell you with walmart we, we go by offer dates because a lot of the folks we deal with have immigration requirements so their start date could still be another six or eight weeks out but you want to set things early as to what you're going to do, what they're going to do, and agree upon them. Okay. What is it, this was from a, I think a, a really early slide, but what is your recommended number of phone interviews versus on-site interviews? And do you prefer individual or panel interviews? Typically I do an interview, but I usually have the managers do an interview or somebody they trust to do one phone interview, maybe two, and then the on-site. I really stress very uh, strongly with managers that let's do one on-site. People are disrupting their lives. They're having to make arrangements to come on site. So let's make this a one and done because people are not gonna be coming back two, three, four times. You get a huge candidate drop off once you get past the first on-site. And okay. what was the other part of the question? Do you prefer individual or panel interviews? The the most success you're going to have as a recruiter is going to get individual interviews, and it could be in succession, one, two, three. Uh, the problem with panel interviews I've seen over my 30 years is it can be an organization where two-thirds may rule, or it could be that there's eight people, and if one says no, it's it. And that can really be detrimental to your hiring success. So you want to encourage the managers to interview individually decide individually, and then come together collectively to make a decision later. But panels are, I try to suggest avoiding panels at all cost. Right, okay. Do you have a specific scorecard that you recommend or an example of one that you can share? I'll show that again. This scorecard here, again, very, very basic. I've expanded this for organization based on the roles. Again, it's a numbering level. And candidates understand the position, their skill set, professional impression, what is their motivation, flexibility to do the job, organizational fit. But you can you can add to this skills, whatever. But giving this to a manager, they put a checkbox. Then he can put some comments here. 
and the recommendation hire or reject. What's great about this is you have a lot of managers that don't know what not to say in HR, and I'm sure some of you guys are chuckling now, but <laughs> you don't want them to put a lot, so sometimes a scorecard can be your best avenue to get them to make a decision. But take something like this and expand it. It's a one-pager. It could be two if it's really in-depth, but give this to everybody. See how they rank people, and it makes it very easy for you. Okay. Now, is this something that, that everybody's going to have access to? Yeah, this, this is one of the two I sent you. These are one of the two. Okay, good. So we'll make sure that we get that out uh, to everyone as well. Uh, th here's a question about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Um, uh, and if so, if you can share this, great. If not, we can answer offline. What is the cost for LinkedIn Sales Navigator and what part in the process are you using the tool? And then there was a, a bolt on to that was, are you seeing the return over regular LinkedIn Premium? Um, when you sign up for LinkedIn Premium, um, it's an option whether you choose recruiting or sales, or I think there's one other one. I chose to go with a LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Let me see if I can bring it up here. But I, I like it for higher level positions because you can identify who people are. You can um, tra track those folks. And if when they make any type of comments out there or they post anything, Sales Navigator lets you know that they've done that. And so when you sign up for LinkedIn, um, uh, LinkedIn Premium, you can choose whether to get the recruiter version or the sales portion of it. And I think I'm bringing it up here as soon as it loads. Give me just a second here. So if people put out articles, but you can use this to search. Um, you can develop leads from this, uh, accounts. These companies aren't following. You can set companies to follow. It's great for develop for salespeople. And one of the things you can do as a recruiter is I've held seminars for recruiters and salespeople because we're both trying to find people. The difference is we're trying to recruit them. They're trying to sell to them. Um, this is probably my uh, work one, which doesn't have much in it, but my purse here we, but with my leads here, uh, I've developed um, where I'm tracking people. So if they have anything that comes out, I'm notified. Um, if I, if people are within organizations, I want to watch, you know, this guy right here, you have to watch out for this Ryan Leary guy. But so if he puts anything <laughs> out on LinkedIn, I'm notified about it. So if I was trying to recruit him, I would say, Hey, I noticed you just put this article out or I understand your company's going through this. So this is a good way to watch competition and also for you agencies to watch your clients. But it's worth the $49 or 59, whatever it is you pay for premium to get this. This is not a LinkedIn recruiter type seat deal. Right. Okay. Now we have, let me just pull this one here. What are your thoughts on closing recs when the manager is unresponsive? And after how much time do you think it is best to close, close it? For example, three weeks of unresponsiveness. I would say talk to your manager first. <laughs> You, you can close the manager and set off a melee of problems with there. But typically, I warn my managers that a week without response is going to hurt the candidate experience. After two weeks of non-response, I tell them that we're not going to work on the role anymore. And by week three, um, typically I've not had them go that long, but the few that I have, I've gone to HR and said, here's my documentation. Here's I try to get a response. I need to be able to meet with this person's supervisor or VP. I need your help and it's being, or your recruiting manager or whatever. But you go one step above them saying, we know you're trying to fill these roles. We know you're losing money or you're not making sales without these. But usually three weeks is the absolute cutoff. But week one, I kind of counsel. Keep Week two, I kind of push and say, are we doing this or not? Week three is when I go uh, and escalate it, but I'd never close it without some consensus from someone else in the organization. I've, no matter how high I've ever been in an organization, I never make that decision alone. Right. Okay. What is the best way to seek out candidates so that you are not reacting to 20 plus job openings that need to be filled ASAP and you don't have the candidate stack or anyone in the pipeline? So what's the best way to find them, you're saying? Or uh, Let's see, what is the best way to seek out candidates? It looks like this might be a more of a pipelining question. Yeah. Um, 
What is the best I way would to buy utilize from tools. Now, I use some paid tools like Hire Tool. <clears throat> I need to get a, a mass of candidates together to be able to reach out to. Again, the resume database is a good way to do it. But belonging to LinkedIn groups, to forums, to meetups, be part of them. Take 30 minutes, an hour a week to go through those, join, make comments, follow people, ask questions, get known for being active in those groups. So when an opportunity comes up and you announce it, you're gonna have a much higher rate of response. Now, this doesn't always work if you're looking for, you know, call center people necessarily, because they're not necessarily tracking anywhere specifically, but for your more professional roles, get involved with groups, you know, social media groups, Facebook groups, uh, you know, be part of it, ask to be an administrator of a group. A lot of people that manage Facebook groups don't have time. They would love for you to help be an administrator on their sites. And that way, when you do something, you know, you're, you're going to get a response. I would also say get involved, offer to do things for free, do resume writing, resume coaching, any of that online. You will get active and passive people looking at taking that to help build your pipeline and, and make it specific to your industry. Right. That's good, 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 good points there. All right. Final question. Uh, how do you adhere to a structured process like this without dragging out the process and making hiring managers feel like the talent acquisition department is just red tape? You make these questions conversational. You don't read them off like you're reading from a script. You, this information, for example, on the intake form, half of that you probably can come up with answers for. So, and another third quarter of it, you could probably assume answers and just ask for validation. So it's a matter of setting expectations and conversations that if I do this for you, you'll do this for me. These are not, they, as much as it looks, uh, you know, like it's a labor of, of documentation and red tape, it really isn't because the, once you have this information as your basis, you turn this into a conversation with the manager. And sometimes that intake form is something you're gonna have to do over two calls, or you maybe will get two thirds of it enough to get the job going for them and some of the calibration calls or meetings you have later. Right. The meetings, you always show them a benefit of every step. The weekliest call is so I can tell you. The intake is so I can get you what you want. Their debriefs are so I can make sure I'm getting you better people. Always sell the benefit to them. Never make it a requirement for your search. Okay. Well, that is uh, all the time that we have. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for a lot of this great information. Uh, for everyone that's left on the call, we will be getting the recording and slides to you shortly, as well as the two documents, which is the uh, process and as well as the uh, scorecard over to everybody. There will also be a couple of links in there for New York H HRTX as well as LA. If you're in those areas, uh, early bird tickets are open. Uh, New York ends shortly. November, or I'm sorry, uh, LA goes a little longer because that's in December. Uh, so go ahead and forward those out or take a look at those if those are good for you. We'd love to see you uh, there in person. Uh, those events benefit the Sourcing Foundation. Uh, so there'll be more information you can find on the site there as well. Um, that's all we've got. Michael, thank you so much for coming out and of course everybody uh, for showing up today.